Thank you, Andy, and thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon to hear about the students' research. We're really glad that you were all able to make it. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to ask that everyone reserve your comments, um, questions, and points of discussion until the end of the presentation. And then when we do open up the floor for that discussion, um, please make sure that you ask your questions individually. So we'll kind of be trying to manage uh, that discussion, in part because we have several viewers that are um, viewing this presentation via the web today, and we'd like to make sure that they're able to take part in the discussion as much as those of us in the room. I'd also like to remind everyone to please turn off your cell phones, or at least quiet them. And with that, I'd like to introduce the uh, 2013 Outer Banks Field Site students. Uh, we'll start with Havana Keaton. She is a senior from Bullock, North Carolina. She did an internship with Robert Perry at the Mano Ahermano Community Garden on Roanoke Island. Next, we have Katie Merrill. She is a senior from Mars Hill, North Carolina. She did her internship with Christine Pickens at the Nature Conservancy Nags Head Wood Preserve. Sam Fotenhauer is a senior from Tempe, Arizona. She did her, her sorry, internship with Holly White and Ben Woody at the Currituck Planning Department. Katrina Phillips is a senior from Saugatuck, Michigan. And she did her internship with Lad Bayless, Sarah Hallis, and Aaron Fleckenstein at the Northeastern Office of the North Carolina Coastal Federation. Taylor Price is a senior from Cary, North Carolina. She did her internship with Kristen Brown at Jeanette's Pier. Jack Roberts is a junior from Owings, Maryland, and he did his internship with Randy Swilling at the National Park Service, Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Amy Rowland is a senior from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and she did her internship with Robert McClendon here at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. He's our coastal design, sustainable design specialist and interim director of uh, academic operations. <laughs> Sam Spaulding is a senior from Jamesville, New York, and he did his internship with Nathan Richards here in the Maritime Heritage Program at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. Mark Strip is a junior from Durham, North Carolina, and he did his internship with Elizabeth Teague in the Nags Head Planning Department. And finally, Laura Zdansky is a senior from here in Manio, and she did her internship with me at um, UNC Coastal Studies Institute in the Renewable Ocean Energy Program. And without further ado, I would like to turn the mic over to Jack. He's gonna start us off today, and Everyone else can have a seat. Okay. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, just We are the 2013 Outer Banks Field Site. Like she said, my name is Jack, and we want to extend this thank you to all the friends and family that came out all the community that made us feel like home out here in the Outer Banks, we really appreciate it. And we're really excited to share what we found with you. So our topic, as you can see, is predator management. And to begin, we started looking at the framework for predator management and how we got to that point. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through some of the policies that frame predator management. We're gonna start with the Endangered Species Act, move on to the recovery plans, and then finally what predator management is. So the Endangered Species Act, and these are three endangered species. We have the polar bear, whooping crane, and Lang's metal mark. Those were species from a book we read over the summer. They're near and dear to our heart here. <laughs> um, and the Endangered Species Act basically was set up in 1973 by Congress to protect species that we were fearing were going extinct. Um, a species is labeled endangered if it is in danger of going extinct soon, and threatened if it is in danger of going extinct in the foreseeable future. So out here on the Outer Banks, um, particularly at Cape Hatteras National Seashore, we have several threatened and endangered species. Not all of them have been listed, disclaimer, but these are the ones we were talking about mostly. Several species of sea turtles, as you can see, and several threatened species, including everyone's favorite, the pipe and plover. So 
The recovery plans are set up by Fish and Wildlife Service and basically want to get these species back to an ecologically healthy point. So to do that, there are several programs that can be used. Um, increased monitoring is definitely one of those. Off-road vehicle restrictions to help protect those species. Predator exclosures to protect nesting areas. And finally, predator management. And now we're finally getting to what predator management is. <laughs> this is the piping plover, as I said, a really interesting and favorite species out here. Um, so predator management is the trapping of predators around these endangered species habitats using non-lethal traps or sometimes lethal traps in certain cases. Um, the predators are then either euthanized and removed or in the case of feral cats brought to a local animal shelter. Um, there's usually a focus on mammalian predators. There are experiments in the work to deal with avian predators and other predators such as ghost crabs, but for now the focus is on mammalian predators. The removal of these species is primarily handled by one full-time trapper um, that works for the Park Service. And since 2007, a total of 2,213 animals have been removed. So to look at this, we wanted to get a broad view of predator management. We split into two groups. We had our biological response group that we nicknamed the natural science group, and our community response group, otherwise known as our social science group. Um, as you can see, the biological response group consisted of Sam Spaulding, Havana Keaton, Katie Merrill, Laura Zadansky, and Mark Stripp. And our social science group consisted of Sam Fotenhauer, Amy Rowland, Katrina Phillips, Taylor Price, and I. So we have our biological response group. We have our community response group. What did they do? Well, the biological response group first looked at the National Park Service annual reports for the pipe and plover and sea turtles and we're trying to figure out what the main causes of death and mortalities were, um, et cetera, and then did a ghost crab study to study the predator abundance of ghost crabs on the seashore and how that is affected. And then our community response group constructed a survey to gauge how the community was feeling about predator management, what their attitudes and beliefs were about it, um, if there were any differences between demographics for that. And without further ado, Havana Keaton is going to start talking about the National Park Service annual reports. Thank you, Jack, for that introduction. Uh, for the first part of our uh, biological response um, research, we looked at uh, annual reports from the National Park Service for both piping plover and the five species of sea turtles that we looked at. And annual reports are a summary of management efforts on the Cape Hatteras National Seashore. Um, these management efforts, they do include uh, predator management, and these annual reports summarize the mortalities on the seashore and uh, the success rates of each of these species. So uh, why are these annual reports conducted? Uh, these, these annual reports monitor the success rates and the survival of these species. Um, as Jack mentioned, the piping plover and the five species of sea turtle on the Cape Hatteras National Seashore are either threatened or endangered under the, the Endangered Species Act. And these species each also have a uh, recovery plan developed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, and there are specific uh, success rates and goals that must be met to one day support these species uh, to de to delist them from the Endangered Species Act list. So our purpose uh, when we analyzed these annual reports from the years 2006 to 2012 uh, was to just really see what type of data the National Park Service had already created and uh, concerning the piping plover and sea turtles. And then we also analyzed available data for items like mortality. So for plovers, for example, if they fledged or not, which is just when the chick is able to fly and leave the nest. Also, we noted life cycle stage. So for piping plover, we looked at whether it was in the egg life cycle stage or the hatchling life cycle stage. And for sea turtles, we looked at if they were in the egg life cycle stage also or the hatchling stage. And then as Katie will mention uh, right after this, uh, we also looked at strandings, which was uh, adult sea turtles. And then we finally uh, put them into, into two categories uh, called unattributed losses and then the attributed losses. So for unattributed, 
Um, the Park Service likes to have almost 100% certainty that a particular mortality was caused by, for example, predation. So if a, a Park Service uh, staff member observes a predation upon a piping plover, then that is an attributed cause. Uh, an attributed, unattributed example would be if even though there would be maybe signs of predators around a piping plover nest, for example, footprints or tracks, uh, they still cannot attribute that for certain to the predator, even though it might have been probable. So, okay, and then we had two research questions that we considered. Uh, the first one was, what are the primary causes of mortality in endangered and threatened species at different life cycle stages on Cape Patterson National Seashore? And the second one was, what proportion of predation mortality is due to each specific predator? So for this first research question, uh, we have a pie chart of our findings here. And again, it was what are the primary causes of mortality in endangered and threatened species at different life cycle stages? Um, as you can see for piping plover, uh, we found that 32% of all losses were attributable. So they did have a particular cause. <clears throat> and as you can see on the graph here, uh, um, just over half of 56% were due to predation reasons and then 32% were, was due to nest abandonment. Um, that's just when plo piping plover parents are no longer seen around a nest area and that's um, usually caused by repeated disturbance to the nest. And then 12% was due to storm and weather. So the second question that we considered for piping plovers were, was what proportion of predation mortality is uh, due to each specific predator. So as you can see here, um, out of, this is just from the earlier slide, if you remember, it was 56% of mortalities was due to predation. This is just a chart that breaks this down further. So here, just over half, uh, you can see that ghost crabs accounted for 54% of these 34 losses due to predation. And then the other half are composed of uh, different predators, including fox, bird, mink, possum, and even un unknown there. So finally, for piping plovers, we found that the majority that, pi excuse me, ghost crabs were the primary predator. And we came up with a few possible reasons for this. Either first, uh, the main ghost crabs are the main predator regardless of a management program. So whether uh, predator management control was there or not, ghost crabs would still be the primary predator. And then we thought of a second reason um, possibly the management program produce, reduces mortality due to other predators. So if since this predator management program is in effect, uh, it has given the ghost crabs more of an opportunity to predate upon piping plover. And now we will hear from Katie to talk about um, and discuss our sea turtle annual report data. Thank you, Havana. And now we will look at the National Park Service annual reports for the sea turtles. And when we talk about individual mortalities for the sea turtles, we are referring to the hatchlings and adult sea turtles. So for our first research question, what are the primary causes of mortality in endangered and threatened species at different life cycle stages on Cape Hatteras National Seashore? We found that there is a total of 3,190 individual sea turtle mortalities including both attributable and unattributable. And we found that causes were attributed in almost all cases, 99%. And this graph breaks down those attributable losses. As you can see, 48% were due to predation, 40% were due to strandings, and 12% were due to human-related causes. And we also looked at the same research question for sea turtle nest losses. And we found that there was a, a total of 125 nest losses, including attributable and unattributable, and that causes were attributed for about two-thirds of these nest losses. And as you can see, most of these nest losses were a result of storm or weather-related events. And for our second research question, what proportion of mortality, or what proportion of predation mortality is due to each specific predator we found that ghost crabs are the primary predator responsible for about 80% of total sea turtle losses due to predation. 
and we found that the reasons for this are probably similar to those for the piping plover. Either the ghost crabs are the main predator reg regardless of a management program, or the management program reduces mortality due to other predators, and then the ghost crabs have a greater opportunity for predation. And when looking at the annual reports for sea turtles, it is important to look at both individual and nest losses. This is because the National Park Service has different ways of categorizing these losses and different ways of documenting them depending on if it is an individual loss or a nest loss. For example, the loss of an entire nest can rarely be attributed to one predator as, excuse me, because usually only a few eggs are predated upon at one time and therefore the National Park Service cannot document the entire nest as being lost to predation. And so they document the losses as individual mortalities lost to predation. On the other hand, there are also instances where an entire nest is lost due to a storm event because the nests are particularly vulnerable due to their low-lying positions on the beach during storm events. And because of this, the National Park Service will document the entire nest as being lost. There are also cases where a bacteria or fungus is found on the eggs, and the National Park Service categorizes this as unattributable because they don't know for sure what causes this, and they record the entire nest as being affected. And it is also important to look at strandings, which is when an adult sea turtle will wash back up on the beach, either alive or dead, and it's important to look at these because it is possible for sea turtles to be injured outside of the seashore, but because that is where the National Park Service finds them, they must, they must document the mortalities in their annual reports. And strandings appear to be a si significant portion of the mortalities, which would warrant future studies, but they do not inform the research questions of this report. Therefore, no conclusions could be drawn from this information because it is unknown what the actual cause of death was that resulted in these strandings on the seashore. For our overall findings for both the sea turtles and the piping plovers, we found that ghost crabs are the primary predator, and this is because reasons probably similar for or similar to the piping plover, because we found that in the Green Search Sea Turtle Recovery Plan of 1991, that raccoons posed the greatest threat to predation or threat to sea turtle survival at that time, which possibly indicates that the management plan is working since raccoons are not a significant predator affecting these two species today. But it is also important to note that that recovery plan for the green sea turtle was not specific to the seashore, so it is impossible to make any definite conclusions about the management program's effectiveness based on this information. And in response to these findings, the Natural Science Group conducted a study to measure ghost crab abundance and distribution along the seashore. And now we'll hear from Sam about that study. Thank you, Katie. Hey, everyone. Um, like Katie said, I'm going to be talking about the ghost crab study, uh, how we developed the study, and also how we carried out our study. So the basis for the National Park Service's predator management plan is the assumption that predators play a significant role in predation of threatened and endangered species. We also know that based on the annual reports, ghost crabs are the primary predator of two very important threatened and endangered species, sea turtles and piping plovers. Despite this, ghost crabs are not currently being managed on Cape Hatteras National Seashore, so we created a third research question to set out to learn more about uh, ghost crabs in Cape Hatteras National Seashore. So our question was, what forces and characteristics drive ghost crab abundance and distribution? So to learn more about this, we looked at some other studies that have been done in the past on ghost crabs uh, from a variety of different locations, including one in Turkey, a number of studies in Australia, and we also looked at data from a previous study done by our advisor, Dr. Lindsay Dubbs, uh, last year in Cape Hatteras National Seashore. These studies generally agreed that ghost crabs are negatively affected by human impact and are also influenced by soil characteristics, so you know, sand, grain size, overall composition. 
and are also influenced by beach profile, so the slope of the beach. So accordingly, we decided to study the relationship between these factors and ghost crab population and abundance. We chose three locations along Cape Hatteras National Seashore. We, cho we chose a beach near Body Island, Spit, near Salvo, and near Little Kinnikee. At each beach, we selected paired sites, one open to beach driving and one not open to beach driving to test for overall human impact. So at each beach, we chose three random transects. Here's an example of our transects from our Salvo site. And uh, we created the transects by stretching a 50 meter long measuring tape from the vegetation line into the intertidal zone. We recorded the number of ghost crab burrows within a meter on either side of the transect using a meter stick as our measuring device. And we also collected sand samples from three zones in each transect. The three zones were the dry sand beach, which we called zone one, the supertidal zone, which we called zone two, and the intertidal zone, which we called zone three. The samples were later analyzed using a ROTAP machine, which sieves the samples and separates them by grain size. We also recorded the beach profile of each transect using a total station, which is a piece of surveying equipment that shoots a laser into what's called a prism pole. Um, it records points in space, and we moved the prism pole along the transect to record changes in elevation. So here's some pictures of us in the field. Uh, we went out in October for two field days and did our research. Uh, in the top right, Mark and, I, I think that's Mark and Havana, are recording the number of ghost crab burrows using a meter stick. On the left, that's a great example of a transect. Um, I believe that's at Body Island Spit. And bottom right, we have a total, our total station. It's a little bit hard to see, but we stationed that on top of the dune for a nice high point of elevation. And here's an example of what one of our beach profile graphs looks like. We inputted the data from the total station into Excel and separated them by zone into different series, and then calculated the slope of each zone using a um, using the Excel formula. So now we are going to hear about the results of our study and the data analysis from Laura. Thank you, Sam. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk to you about the results from the ghost crab study. Uh, particularly the number of ghost crab burrows that we observed on the beach in the different areas. So this is a graph of our results at each location that we did our survey at. So, and they're divided by the zones that we found them in. So the, this, uh, these graphs were located at Body Island. Um, the ones in the middle are Little Kinnikeet and the far right are Salvo. Experimental locations were those that were open to beach driving while control were only open to pedestrian access. As you can see from the graph, we had some differences in the number of ghost crabs that we found between locations, particularly between Body Island and the other locations. And also, we saw some differences between ORV and ORV access and pedestrian only access, but when we analyzed them further using statistical tests, we found that those differences were not significant. So how does this relate to some of the factors that we thought were driving ghost crab abundances on the beach? We found that the sediment characteristics had no influence on where we found ghost crabs along the transects or at the different beaches. In fact, we found that, relatively speaking, the sand on the entirety of the Cape Hatteras National Seashore at our locations is, for the most part, fairly uniform, even between the zones. So that had no effect on where we found ghost crab burrows. So we're going we're gonna to look at this graph again just because it helps explain why we found no difference between zone or beach driving. 
So at the zones, we see that there are relatively different distributions of ghost crab burrows, depending on whether you are closer to the shore or closer to the sand dunes. They're all fairly randomly distributed. Like look at the difference between the salvo. There's far more ghost crabs in zone three than the other zones, yet in Body Island, we found far more, about the same number of ghost crabs in zone two and zone one. And again, we found no significant difference between beaches that were open to beach driving and closed to beach driving in the number of ghost crab holes. And the best beach to illustrate that is at Body Island where we found relatively the same number of ghost crab burrows between beaches. We also found no influence from beach profile. So that's the slope of the beach and the different zones. So this is up near the dunes and the intertidal, sorry, the supertidal zone. So that dry sand beach that gets covered in bad storms and then the intertidal zone, which is that area where you're used to seeing the beach at high tide or low tide. And you can also see that the transect lengths are about, um, a meter is about a yard. So this is about half a football field length across, so a very long transect. And we found that the slope didn't affect the number of ghost crab holes that we saw at different locations. However, what we did find was that the location made, an in, made a difference on how many ghost crab holes we saw, and also the width of the island at the location where we were at. So at Little Kinnikeet, the island is fairly narrow. It's about between a quarter to a half a mile wide, while at Body Island, it's a little over a mile wide. We found far more ghost crab holes at the Body Island location than we did at the Little Kinnikeet location. Seeing this relationship between abundance and area implies that there might be something interesting going on with the, the density of ghost crab burrows along the beach. The density is a calculation of the average number of ghost crab burrows per area that we surveyed. We found that there is a relatively uniform density of ghost crab burrows on the Cape Hatteras National Seashore. So when we looked at larger areas, we found larger numbers of ghost crabs. And again, the body island sites were the largest sites that we observed. The islands were bigger and the, the transects were longer. And we found the highest number of ghost crab burrows there. So our overall findings were that the driving factors of ghost crab burrow abundance may, may be from outside the current management area, which is focused on the dry sand beach, which is where the turtles and plovers are currently nesting. And so predator removal is focused on those area and also opportunistically where there are known predator um, tracks and trails that a regular predator uh, uses that has been observed to, um, to consume the, the species of interest. So our research implies that perhaps there should be a focus on the habitat outside of the beach area. So that would be the vegetation from behind the berm or perhaps on the sound side of the island. So some suggestions for future studies based on our current research is that in the future, studies should expand, to expand their scope to habitat areas outside of the dry sand beach because we have found that there are some driving influences, driving factors influencing, bur sorry, driving factors that influence predator abundance on the beach from outside of the beach area. So also, we, our study sites, our study days were just after the beach closures due to the federal government shutdown. And um, there may have been an effect of the closure to beach driving and the number of ghost crabs that we observed. So if the ghost crabs happen to repopulate beaches that they had previously abandoned due to human presence, then with the closure, they may have opportunistically returned to those beaches. However, be our study could not encompass the scope of that problem as well. So we cannot account for any influence uh, that, 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 that that may have caused. So in the future, further studies may try to research how fast ghost crabs repopulate beaches that are closed to beach driving. And now Taylor will take us through the methodology and process of the community response research. Hi everyone, um, thanks to Laura for wrapping up that biological section for us. So I worked with the rest of our group and we looked at the community response. So what we wanted to do is we 
when we kind of talked to different people in the area and kind of were introduced to the issue at hand, we saw that there's a lot of people who live on Cape Hatteras National Seashore who might be affected by these issues. So we wanted to know if the predator management program, um, how they thought about it, what they felt, um, and how that could impact in the future. So what, how we chose to do this was through different survey methods. So we had two different things. We did qualitative interviews, which are basically just talking to different representatives and stakeholders and the issues. And we used that to create our quantitative survey, which we did like statistical analysis and some other things on it to get some numbers and good data. So in order to talk to people, we talked first to some representatives from the National Park Service, and they helped us get that framework that Jack talked about in the beginning, how the Endangered Species Act works, and all the different things that go into predator management, getting some good facts from them. And then from there, we talked to different stakeholders and wanted to know their attitudes and beliefs towards the program as well. So we talked to representatives from the North Carolina Beach Buggy Association, as well as folks from the Southern Environmental Law Center, who gave their perspectives and helped us put everything into context. And like I said earlier, these interviews helped us form our survey, and we found some really interesting things from just talking to people that we wanted to further understand. Um, so some of the variables that we came up with is that we wanted to know about overall knowledge of the program. So there's a lot of different factors, and a lot of people might not understand how the Endangered Species Act works or what the National Park Service is doing when they're trapping. So we wanted to know if residents here knew all the things that were going on. Um, we also wanted to know where people were finding their information from. So we know that the Outer Banks has a very big online presence and a lot of publications and things like that. So where are people learning about the Predator Management Program was really important to us. And we also wanted to know about public acceptability, which is really important um, when we talk about just the framework that goes into making management decisions. Um, and then in addition, we saw some other cool things that we thought could be interesting to study and we wanted to get some answers from. So for residents, we wanted to look at how close people lived to the Cape Hatteras National Seashore. So a lot of people may be living on Roanoke Island or in Nags Head or Kitty Hawk aren't right there in the issues and they might not know as much. Um, so we wanted to know if that would make a difference. We also wanted to look at that um, involvement. Um, so on our survey, we had a few questions about involvement, and we wanted to know if people were participating in online forums, if they were talking to their neighbors, if they were um, getting involved in the issues, um, and thought that they knew a lot about that. And then we also looked at how we were going to distribute our survey. So in the past, some groups have only did, done mail surveys, but we thought it would be nice to do an intercept survey, which is getting out and talking to people, standing out in front of some businesses and asking questions, as well as distributing a web survey and see if we could reach a broader audience that way. So from that, we created our survey. Um, and then we just came up with some different research questions kind of going off of those variables. So like I said, we wanted to know how much people knew, um, the knowledge, where did people get that information from regarding the issues, and what are those beliefs and attitudes. So we constructed our survey. It took some different days, but we got a good product and there's copies in the back if you wanted to see the questions that we asked. And many of you might have also taken that survey as well. Um, and we deployed the survey and used Bonner Bridge as a divider. So when just talking about the different issues with some of our stakeholders, we kind of were under the impression that maybe this bridge here kind of separated the people and what they thought about it. Um, so we kind of used that when we did our mail and intercept surveys. Um, and we focused on Manio and Nags Head when we distributed those and Hatteras Island. So when we did the web surveys, we weren't exactly sure where people were going to come from, if they were going to come from our selected locations, but we just asked people if they lived north or south of the bridge, and that helped us a lot. Um, so we got almost 550 responses, which was great, and made our data analyzing super fun. Um, so, so we did a lot of statistical tests and analysis and lots of Excel um, and things like that, but I think we got some really good data. Um, but one of those big things that we wanted to know was knowledge, so going off of that first research question, what we found was that overall knowledge of the program was fairly low. So on our survey, we asked four knowledge questions, so we wanted to know um, about the extent of the program. So one of the questions was, how many trappers do you think that they have on, um, from the National Park Service, and they only have one, and a lot of people didn't know that. That was the most missed question. Um, and then we also wanted to know about how many animals were trapped. Um, do you think that other national parks have a predator management program, which they all 
do. And then we wanted to know just if people knew the number of animals trapped and how they did that, if they used lethal or non-lethal traps. So from those four questions, we categorized them into low, medium, and high knowledge. Um, and that low knowledge were people who got two or fewer of our questions correct. So that would be people scoring 50% or less. Um, and what we saw was that almost half or a little over half had that low knowledge. Um, and then medium knowledge were people who got three questions correct and high knowledge were people who got all four correct. And so what we found was that although people may know a lot about the predator management program, they didn't know a lot of those basic details about the trappers or what animals are actually um, controlled for. Um, and so we want to compare those to our other variables. So we had demographics, which focused on residency and education, and also involvement within the forums and things like that. So what we found was that there was no statistical significance between level of education and program knowledge. So this was really important for us to just kind of learn if you did have a master's degree in science, it doesn't mean that you know more about this program. Anyone can know about it. Every, there's information out there for everyone. And then we also saw that residency north or south also had no effect, which was a really big finding for us because we would have assumed that maybe if you live on Hatteras Island, you're right there on the national seashore, maybe you know some no more, but we saw that that wasn't an effect either. Numbers were about the same for both. And then as for involvement, we also found something that was pretty interesting to us is that those who had lower knowledge, so scoring a 50% or less, tended to report higher involvement in those forums and talking to their neighbors and things like that. So that might be one of the reasons <laughs> that <laughs> there is some, maybe some misinformation or spreading some different things that may or may not be true about the program. So that was two of our pretty interesting findings. And I think that the residency north or south is one of our more particular things. So we're gonna hear from Katrina, who's gonna talk a little bit more about what we found. And she's gonna focus on some information sources that are out here on the Outer Banks. Thank you, Taylor. So to answer our second research question, which was where do people get information about the predator management program and other issues on the seashore, we asked respondents to check their top three most relied on information sources out of the list uh, shown in this graph. And as you can see, responses were pretty varied. And this just shows that um, all or many of these information sources could be used to distribute information and to reach a wide audience. And the top three most popular sources were social media, Outer Banks Voice, and the Island Free Press. So we took these top three information sources and we compared their popularity between our two different areas of residence, north and south of the Bonner Bridge, to see if there are any significant differences. And we found that the Island Free Press is much more popular south of the Bonner Bridge, while the Outer Banks Voice is much more popular to the north. We also found that the different information sources weren't related to the level of knowledge about the program, which would suggest that all of these different sources are providing almost equal information about the program. We asked a few other questions to find out where people get their information about the program and how involved they are in the issues. These questions are shown right here on the graph. And from our results, we found that the majority of respondents report that they use online news sources more than print news sources, that they regularly, regularly seek out information about the issues on the seashore, and that they understand the issues related to predator management. And this is important because it shows that there is a desire for knowledge and that the internet could be the most effective medium for distributing information. To answer our third research question, on our survey we asked respondents a few different questions about their attitudes towards predators. And we also presented a few different management strategies and asked respondents to rate them as either unacceptable or acceptable. One such statement was just generally killing animals to protect endangered species. And as you can see from our graph, about 85% of respondents labeled this as either unacceptable or slightly unacceptable. And this low level of acceptability was a general trend that we saw in almost all of our questions about different management strategies. The only strategy that we found to be slightly acceptable by respondents was predator control by sterilization, which is not currently used at the seashore. These findings of general low acceptability of management strategies are important because they show that there could be a general disagreement among the public with the premise for the Endangered Species Act, 
which is that threatened and endangered species should be more protected than other animals because they're at a higher risk of extinction. Now, Sam is going to continue discussing the results of our study of the community response to predator management. Thanks, Katrina. So I will be elaborating on uh, what we found people's beliefs and attitudes to be towards predator management. We, were, we found that the majority of respondents found predator management unacceptable. We asked several different questions uh, discussing different methods, and pretty much across the board, it was overwhelmingly disagreement. For example, um, this graph, we asked several statements and asked respondents to choose strongly disagree disagree, slightly disagree, slightly agree, agree, or strongly agree. The National Park Service should not manage predators. Clearly, a high majority agreed with that statement. Also, only non-lethal traps should be used to remove predators, even if they are less effective. And predators should only be controlled when they pose a threat to humans. Again, pr pretty much across the board, there was a strong tendency to agree and therefore be less accepting of the predator management program. So the next thing we wanted to look at was how did predator management acceptance relate to the different variables that we tested. The first one was residency, or excuse me, the first one was knowledge. So how does level of knowledge affect or influence with uh, acceptability. We found that high levels of knowledge are related to a greater acceptance of the program. This does not imply causation, this is simply a relationship. Um, this is a graph that also demonstrates this. Two statements that we used to evaluate acceptability and how they related to respondents who had a high level of knowledge, a medium level of knowledge, and a low level of knowledge. At zero is um, kind of neutral, and the way we coded our answers, if you're above zero, then you're more accepting, and if you're below zero, then you're unaccepting. So clearly, in both cases, low level of knowledge, which is in blue, is unaccepting, and high level of knowledge, which is in green, is accepting. This has big implications because if the national Park Service is interested in increasing public support, then education would be an appropriate strategy. So the next one that we looked at was involvement. We found that higher levels of involvement tend to correlate with low levels of unacceptability. Now this could be because people who are who are unaccepting the program seek to be more involved. Um, we don't know, we did not test for that. But like Taylor said, we measured for levels of involvement based on self-reporting. How often do you post in forums? How engaged are you in Cape Hatteras National Seashore Resource um, Management? And we compared these answers with also two statements that we tested to evaluate acceptability. Likewise, if you're under zero, then you're unaccepting. So those with high level of knowledge are clearly much more unaccepting than those with low level of knowledge. It's important to know, and this is a good example, that even though high level of, uh, I'm sorry, high level involvement is more unaccepting than low level involvement. I get it mixed up. <laughs> um, even if you're, even, if you have a high or low, pretty much everyone who answered these statements were still unaccepting of the predator management program. We did find that there was little relationship with level of knowledge and higher involvement. Taylor discussed this. Um, we found that there is no statistical relationship there. So just because a respondent is really involved in the program doesn't mean that they have a high level of knowledge about it. This is important because those who are really involved are more likely to share their views on forums and spread education materials to others, and those may not necessarily be accurate. Finally, the last variable we found significant was residency. We found that people who live south of the Bonner Bridge are more unacceptable of the predator management program. This could be because they're more personally affected by consequences of management. Um, another graph that demonstrates this, north is in blue and south is in red. Clearly there's a big difference between acceptability. Um, this is also important because if the National Park Service was interested in increasing public support, it would be appropriate to target the South, people, excuse me, people who live south of the bridge. And, um, and it's also important because we found that Free Island Press was by far the biggest information source for those who live south of the bridge, so using Free Island Press may be an appropriate medium. It's important to note that when we did the study, we did not ask for why. Uh, people approved or disapproved of the study, we simply asked for if they did. We didn't know what people thought about it, and so we wanted to kind of get a solid understanding of that and gave several different methods of, um, 
of predator management and see what people thought. Now that we know that the public is overwhelmingly unaccepting of the program, it would be appropriate to next look at the reasons behind that. Some of the reasons, and we realize this, may be rooted and uh, dislike or disagreement with National Park Service because of recent controversies, and so that may influence predator management. It's important to recognize that predator management is not an issue on its own, but everything is involved in context, so a lot of other events that are happening on Cape Hatteras could be influencing people's opinions of predator management. So finally, Mark and, or Mark and Amy will discuss the conclusion of our reports. Thank you, Sam. So wrapping up, the main goal of our research was to better understand what informs management on Cape Hatteras. And so this figure shows that predator management is informed by a combination of law and policy, public input, and scientific research. So legislation like the Endangered Species Act authorizes the Park Service to meet recovery plan goals by using strategies like predator management. Public input and community support is important for the long-term success of broader goals like biodiversity protection. And scientific research is important to understand what's working and what isn't working. And that way we can focus on strategies to maximize success. So through this learning experience, I think we all came to realize that future policy is likely to be more successful if it's adaptable to ongoing scientific research and community support. And so our three final conclusions related to finding effectiveness of the predator management program, to diversifying management scope, and also to increase the transparency of future management actions. So. So first, Amy and I will talk about the effectiveness or efficacy of the program. Um, it's a major issue that the public currently has with the predator management program that's in place is that the National Park Service has no means of establishing the effectiveness of the program. This is primarily due to ethical concerns as well as requirements by the Endangered Species Act that prevent the National Park Service from, a step from uh, conducting a study that would be aimed at establishing the effectiveness of the program. Um, from a practicality standpoint, the National Park Service cannot, for example, manage for predators around some nests along the seashore and then not others. And that has been a major roadblock for the National Park Service in developing or in establishing the effectiveness of the program. Um, however, it was determined by the Natural Research Science, the Natural Science Research Group, that uh, ghost crabs are the primary predator of piping plovers and sea turtles at the seashore. Um, it's important to note, however, that the National Park Service is not currently managing for ghost crabs. Uh, this would indicate that by incorporating ghost crabs into the predator management program, the National Park Service could establish the uh, effectiveness of at least that portion of the program by looking at success rates and predation rates of sea turtles and piping plovers before the implementation of that part of the program and then afterwards. So as it stands, predator management could continue without proof of efficacy and without public support, but the alternative would be to stop predator management completely. So with this trade-off, the Park Service would still be required to meet recovery plan goals to reduce threatened and endangered species mortality by implementing other strategies, and it's possible that these strategies, like beach closures, could be less popular than the current predator management plan. So next I'll talk about the diversifying the management scope of the predator plan predator management program. Um, as I've mentioned earlier and has, as several other students have mentioned, um, the uh, ghost crabs are the primary predators of sea turtles and piping plovers at the seashore. And uh, by including ghost crabs into the predator management program, the National Park Service might be able to further reduce predation rates. Um, furthermore, one of the more interesting findings of the Natural Science Research Group was that uh, ghost crab abundance was most closely linked with, um, with island width. And that could be due to a number of factors, including decreased susceptibility to storm events and washovers, as well as uh, increased habitat. For example, behind the dunes, there exists significant vegetation and shrubbery that serves as habitat for predators to live and reproduce. Um, if the NPS were to focus their efforts more behind the dunes, then they might be able to look more specifically at, reproduct at lowering reproductive rates of, of predators. And in doing so, they could simultaneously limit the amount of predator euthan euthanization that might be required by the program. Um, 
social, social science research suggests that the public is strictly opposed to predator killing even, at the, even if it benefits uh, endangered and threatened species. So as a result, if the NPS were to focus more on lowering reproductive rates of predators, it could also result in increased acceptance of the program. Right, and our last conclusion dealt with increasing the transparency of the predator management program. So if, building off what Mark was saying, if the Park Service decided to implement a ghost crab, to implement management of ghost crabs as predators of threatened and endangered species, it could be a great opportunity to rework the relationship with the public so they could see a plan go into effect from creation and implementation and results. We also, our social science research found that there was some misinformation available about the program, so the Park Service could target some top information sources to get accurate information to the public. And we also found that annual reports and other scientific literature isn't exactly written for a public audience, so it could be useful to summarize key findings of these reports and make them readily available to the public in materials that are easy to understand. So now, as a group, we wanted to share some of our other conclusions that are not as scientific. <laughs> so as Amy said, we're going to talk about things that we have learned that we're kind of outside the scope of our study. Um, I learned that data analysis is never finished. You can always keep going. There's always some other statistical test you can possibly do and maybe tease something else out. And there's a point where you just have to put it down and walk away. Okay, the second thing we learned was that flip flop should not be worn when conducting field work, especially if you're walking over areas with prickly pears and sand spurs. <laughs> The next thing we learned is that government shutdowns won't deter Dr. Dobbs. She is unstoppable. <laughs> um, and then the fourth one is that deadlines are always closer than they appear. So even though we got all these dates in August and September, once no Thanksgiving break hit, we were like, oh, we still have a lot of work to do. So <laughs> always keep those in mind. <laughs> Our fifth one is that uh, when we went out and administered the surveys and really just talked to community members, we learned so much more about the issue that we wouldn't have gotten if we just looked at the statistics. By actually talking to people, it gave us a lot of context to what their answers really meant. So when in doubt, make another Google Doc. When we weren't sure where to go, how to start writing, we would just make another Google Doc. And if you don't know what a Google Doc is, it's pretty much just a document that everyone can see and add to. So we probably had like 25 going. <laughs> Our seventh one is that 12-hour uh, field days are tiring but very rewarding. We went out at uh, 5.30 in the morning to conduct our ghost crab study, and it was pretty rigorous, but it was some of the, my favorite days of the entire field site. Uh, if you've never seen a sunrise on the beach, then you are really missing out. Um, we also learned that nothing is black and white. This is something that is just a really great life lesson to have. I think coming into this, at least I had the opinion that there were good guys and bad guys, and there's not. Uh, life is full of grays, like the gray hair we all got after this project was finished. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really a big takeaway for us. Okay, we also found that uh, people value when their opinion is heard. Uh, I think that social science group can really attest to this. Um, and I know I can personally when I was completing my internship, but people just really like it when you take the time to listen to them and just consider what they have to say. Okay. The final thing that we learned was that the key to learning is to keep an open mind. And we just found that if we had come in this into this project with a closed mind and only heard one side or only heard the things that we wanted to hear, for example, we probably wouldn't have learned as much, but by keeping open minds to all aspects of the topic, we just learned a ton, um, even things that we didn't think we would learn. So now I think we have a really extensive list of acknowledgments <laughs> because so many people have helped us with this project and it really wouldn't have been possible without them. So thank you. And I thank you. <laughs>
We will take questions now. Um, we ask, just simple raise your hand, we'll call on you. Um, when you stand up, please say it as loud as you can and we'll repeat the question for those listening online and we'll answer it to the best of our abilities. Please be nice. <laughs> <laughs> So the question was, if ghost crabs were the primary predator for each year, 2006 through 2012, um, I'm pretty sure that they were, but I know that we have graphs in our actual report, which we have copies of in the back, that has the predators by each, for each year, for each species, too. But I'm pretty sure, weren't they? I'm pretty sure that they were. <laughs> So the question was, if uh, ghost crab predation is more visible, more apparent than, say, a raccoon grabbing eggs, I would say, based on the reports that we read, um, there were notes included for each attributed loss and also attri unattributed losses. Generally, it, it really depends. Usually, raccoons leave more defined tracks than ghost crabs do. Um, they, ghost crabs are more visible in finding you know, egg fragments, or there were situations where ghost crabs were literally caught on tape taking eggs. Um, so it, it really it depends. Um, generally, there's not a huge difference, though. And studies here go back to the 80s that point out ghost crabs as being the prime predator. But in, in your research, did you ever find any place or any indication through your contact with the Park Service where there's ever been any kind of successful I believe they are working on programs to successfully control ghost crabs, and they have had some anecdotal success so far. I believe that's something coming in the future. I'm sure there are people from the Park Service here you could talk to about that. Um, as you know, ghost crabs are a little harder to trap, um, just to catch. I mean, they're small, they're quick. It's not as simple as catching them in a foot clam trap. Um, the same, I believe, they are looking at um, methods to trap for avian predators, especially for piping plovers. Um, but again, it's, it's more complicated. You can't just walk out on the beach with a shotgun and shoot a seagull when it's going after a piping plover. So we're work I believe they're working on it. Oh, my. <laughs> uh, Robert? Did you get a sense of how interested the National Park Service Forgot. was or is interested in, uh, in your study itself? Um, can you repeat the question? Do you get a sense of how interested the National Park Service is in the study itself? So the question was, did we get a sense of how interested the Park Service was in our research? Um, we had several conversations with members of the National Park Service, and they were very supportive in our findings or in our research, and they wanted to make sure that we had our facts correct and that we had a good communication back and forth. So I would say that, yes, they are interested in the results of our research and also kind of how it can inform their future decisions. Uh, so the question was, how did we control for the lunar cycle and its impact on ghost crab populations? We only had two sampling days, and we had a very limited time period to do this, so we did not have a chance to take that into effect. In future studies, I would highly recommend people do that, also to try and control for time and sort of the condition, make sure that the conditions leading up to sampling date were constant, so like no large storms, unless every single time is a large storm. <laughs> David, that seemed, uh, what do you know about the absolute number of uh, off-road vehicles at those three locations? Do you have any data on that? Or more than 
Um, so the question was, how uh, did we know what the absolute number of off-road vehicles that accessed at those beach locations? And currently, they they aren't able to track how what the popularity, I guess, of certain sites are. So no. And also, in the two weeks leading up to our uh, research, was the closure. So that would have been zero. <laughs> Um, yes. Uh, in general, uh, repeat the question. <laughs> so the question was what kind of animals were removed from the park in those years from 2007 to now. Um, generally, raccoons, possums, um, mink, um, help me out guys, <laughs> feral cats. Feral cats were removed, not killed. Um, and raccoon, I think I said raccoons, foxes. <laughs> Nutria. And I believe that was it. My question is for the social scientists. Uh, were there any demographical differences, maybe age differences between residents on the south of the bridge versus those on the north of the bridge? We didn't test for ages. Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, um, were there any demographical differences between residents on the south and north of the bridge? The demographics that we tested for were level of education, so um, high school through graduate degree, and then where they lived. We didn't test for ages um, or any other kind of typical demographic sort of questions. Anything else? Sure. So the question or comment was, um, did, we, did we look into kind of the cultural reasons why uh, respondents may, be, may disagree with management of endangered species? And it's something we certainly talked about and thought about, and we wrote a little bit in our, in our report. Since we didn't test for that, um, we kept the report mostly you know, things we could have data to support. But in our talking with people, we definitely noted that there is, um, that some of the reasons that respondents may not be as accepting towards killing other animals or protecting, or um, restrictions towards animals to protect endang endangered species could be for cultural re uh, reasons. As far as for us, um, our semester here is over, but we're hoping, at least personally, I hope that the students next year continue on this topic um, and perhaps further research into those sort of questions. I think they're pretty interesting, but they're certainly harder to evaluate. Yeah, and just adding to that, I think we kind of touched upon that Cape Hatteras National Seashore and the Outer Banks and everything is a very interesting relationship because they're very dependent on each other for different things. So that relationship is really important. Um, so although we didn't look at it, there's definitely a relationship between those things and any negative thing that happens to one can affect the other. So that was interesting to us. The trapping of feral cats is, is very highly controversial. Mm -hmm. We know both sides of the bridge on that. And the typical answer is, well, they're trapped live and turned over to the local. Was there any questions asked how many of those animals turned over to the local authorities? Were they euthanized uh, versus you know, adopted or given back? Uh, you know, it's, it's like passing the buck. I, I did my thing uh, with somebody else's. Was there any questions asked? Um, so the question was, um, is there any indication of what happens to the feral cats after they are passed on to the local authorities or USPC, um, animal shelters and such? We do not know. Um, it's not something we looked at in our research. It wasn't really um, too pertinent to our research, but we did, I haven't heard anything about that, no. So in some of the intercept surveys and the mails that we received back, a lot of 
people would write comments or tell us personally that they were okay with feral cats and that feral cats had become a problem. And so in some cases, we had a question that asked, if it was acceptable to trap foxes and feral cats, I think, or raccoons and feral cats. And some people would just circle feral cats and then link that to being acceptable. So I found that kind of interesting. But we don't have any definitive proof about that. Well, there's never really been any data, that's why I asked. Yeah. So the question was, uh, what would be the next thing we would like to research? I think the social science group, as Sam said, would really like to dive into these details as to why people feel these ways. Um, when we built our survey, that's not something we were thinking about right away. We didn't quite know how to grasp that firmly. But um, I think that's something we would be interested in. If some, yeah. uh, For the natural science group, uh, I think it would be interesting to learn more about ghost crab populations outside of the seashore, uh, just for comparisons along the same geographical location. And I think it would also be interesting to learn more about ghost crab populations in, re in relation to other nests of piping plovers and sea turtles, because we did not really consider if those species were around the sites that we looked at. So I think that would be interesting. <laughs> 